The tree of fruity fruit is a single fruit tree that grows over 40 different types of stone fruit, including peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, and almonds. The idea came from just sort of a fascination with the process of grafting. When I'd seen it done as a child, it was Dr. Seuss and Frankenstein and just about everything fantastic. Through the project, I've, I've worked with a lot of growers. And at first, they didn't understand it because they were, why would you want to have a tree with that many different fruit on it? You would have to go back over and over to continue to harvest all the fruit. The project is, for me, always an art project. Part of the idea for the Tree of 40 Fruit was to plant them in locations that people would sort of stumble upon. Once they happened upon one of these trees, they would start to question, why are the leaves shaped differently? Why are they different colors? And then in summer, when you would see all of these different fruit growing on them, and of course in spring when they blossom in different colors. It is an artwork. When I first started, I just sort of grafted the branches on. So each variety blossoms at a slightly different time. And I had a tree that blossomed all on one side, but looked dead on the other. From that point on, I created a timeline of when all of these different varieties blossom in relationship to each other. So I could essentially sculpt how the tree would blossom. For each of the trees, I keep a map, essentially, or a diagram of the tree. Yeah, it takes a really long time. I start a tree and I let it grow for about three years. And at that point, I can come in and start to graft onto those branches. Unlike any other artworks that, that I've made, these things continuously evolve. I think one of the reasons why I've been able to keep it going for so long is that every year it's something new. And when you come out here and the trees are all in blossom, it's really kind of an amazing experience. Plus you get fruit all summer. <laughs> all right, Matthew chapter 21. Let's go back a little bit in our text and read some of what we covered last week in chapter 21, verse 12, it says that Jesus went into the temple of God and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant, and they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yeah. Have you not read, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? And then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. So this was now one day ago that Jesus had gone into the temple and shown such uh, assertiveness, if not aggression, and uh, it was really a demonstration of how unimpressed he was with what was happening in the temple, or rather what was not happening in the temple, right? It should have been, according to him, a house of prayer, and he says it's been turned into a den of thieves. And so uh, in the temple there in Jerusalem, what should have been all along a spiritual ministry, Jesus comes and finds that it's turned into nothing more than a good business. They've taken ministry and turned it into business. Well, that's shocking because that never happens in 2023, does it? Oh, of course it does. It happens all the time and it doesn't please God or Jesus or anybody. It does no good. Um, and so there we are in the first century. Jesus uh, comes into Jerusalem. He sees the temple. Uh, and what they had done was they just totally secularized the temple. They'd turn it into a worldly thing. And, of course, we read then that Jesus was infuriated with it all. And again, I would tell you that this is often the case. I'm sad to say, but it is often the case with Christian ministry in our day. 
<clears throat> and it's not, it's not difficult for a ministry to take that slide. I think that what can begin as a good work of God initiated by the Holy Spirit over time can uh, just gradually conform to the world. <clears throat> there is in some uh, ministries a, an increasing preoccupation with things like attendance and uh, you know, public acceptance and how does the community see us and, and they all uh, seek to achieve personal enjoyment out of the ministry and they want to uh, make sure that everybody has a wonderful time and so um, these become greater concerns over the years uh, than the concern for biblical integrity and maintaining a, a standard of, of operation that God approves of. Uh, there's less of a concern for God's endorsement on the ministry, and so whether Jesus likes it at all uh, or not doesn't really concern us anymore because we've got a good business going. And I'll tell you that the folks that are involved in ministries like that, uh, generally speaking, they're looking for different results than God is. And we can make the same mistake where we start looking for, well, let's count heads and how many people showed up to church this Sunday and then uh, count them again next week to see how many people returned. And then we got to take a look in the uh, tide box and find out how much money we've got coming in. And we got to see how, how, how effective we were uh, at this weekend's outreach. And we got to start charting graphs and, and, and making our plans based upon this business model. Uh, but that should never be a ministry's concern. The top concern of any ministry should be to please God and to be biblical in their efforts. Uh, but again, I think some ministries are looking for results that are entirely different than the results that God would hope to see out of that ministry. And that explains why people in ministry can sometimes be so happy with it when actually Jesus Christ is enraged by it. And that's what we are dealing with here as Jesus comes into the very heart of Jerusalem to the temple itself, and he's enraged. He's flipping over tables. This is just, this is the Jesus we believe in. He's PO'd. You know, you don't flip over tables because you're in a good mood and happy with everything. He's turning over furniture, and in one account it says that he braided a whip and did this. And, uh, you know, I don't know what you do with a whip, but, it, you know, generally speaking, you strike something with it. Uh, at any rate, Jesus ain't happy, and <clears throat> we see that clearly here. And, and so the account that we... Uh, go into this morning is both sad and concerning. It's sad and concerning. Sad, I believe, because we're looking at um, the Lord's disappointment in Israel. And any good Christian should have a heart for Israel because they are uh, God's chosen people. He's done some neat things through them, and it's because of them that really we exist, you know, as a spiritual family. Uh, and so it's sad to see how upset God is and Jesus is with uh, the Jewish people. Uh, but it's concerning as well because uh, I, as a pastor, have to wonder, uh, how, how do I not know or how do we not know that God doesn't feel the same way about us here in this ministry? Um, because I bet they would never have thought that God himself was as displeased with what was going on in the temple as, they actually, as he actually was. I, I think that this was a shock to them that God felt this way. I think they uh, only took it as further proof that Jesus isn't God. Because God obviously approves of what we do around here. And this guy ain't happy. So... Uh, but I have to wonder how God does feel about us because just so we are aware of it, God does have an opinion of Believer's Church Duluth. You ever wonder what he thinks? How are we doing here? Are we still upholding biblical principles? Are we still seeking the Lord and following his direction? Are we still operating by the strength of the Holy Spirit? Or have we now traded that away for the strength of the flesh? Because after all, though we might be a little bit thin in here, you know, we do got a bit of strength, don't we? We got a coffee trailer and we got events to go to and we got ministries to run and we have things happening here. We got membership and we got tithers and we got attendance and what else could you ask for except for greater numbers? So let's really pump up the numbers and see what we can do. Maybe we'll get a bouncy house for the front yard and you know, attract more families. You know, we've always joked around about that because we don't generally do that. <laughs> We're not going to um, do what uh, some have been accused of in New Testament writings of um, and turning it into business and um, trying to con people into becoming a Christian. We're just going to keep doing what we think the Lord wants us to do, and if people want to join the parade, then that's fine with us. If they don't, I, we kind of understand. We're a kind of a goofy, weird bunch of people, 
and uh, we're sinners too. So if you don't want to hang out with us, I know why, but I would, um, I would caution you of turning your back because something turns you off around here. At any rate, and Jesus ain't happy. It says that the morning came in verse 18, and as he returned to the city, he was hungry, <clears throat> and he saw a fig tree by the road. Not an uncommon thing for fig trees in Israel. Uh, he came to it there, found nothing on it but leaves, and he said to it, now this is a, a curse, uh, and I have no idea what kind of tone this was said with, uh, but I would read a little bit of frustration into it, a little bit of disappointment. Let no fruit grow on you ever again. He's done. He's done with that tree. He's done. Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the tree withered away. So what do we do with this? It's just two verses. You know, I don't know how many thousands of verses are in the Bible, but there's just a couple that bother us. Here we have some. Um, is this just Jesus flying off the cuff and, you know, he can't control himself? Is this some kind of impulsive uh, demonstration of uncontrolled emotion on account of his hunger? Because does, Matthew does include that he was hungry here. So is this what Jesus looks like when he's LBS? <laughs> right? So he turned into a Snickers commercial all of a sudden. And he's, you know, lasers in his eyes and he hasn't had his, he needs protein. That's what he needs. That's just, Jesus didn't have his breakfast. Uh, no egg muffin or anything like that. And now he's killing stuff. Is that what's going on here? <clears throat> After all, Matthew doesn't say it, but Mark does in chapter 11. But this wasn't even the season for figs. So what's up with Jesus here? I only know what's in my Bible. So if I'm going to try and answer those kinds of questions, which I know are, I know questions like this rise when we read texts like this, I'll tell you that based on what I do read in Scripture, physical hunger, though it might have been a factor in, in all of this, and it was enough that Matthew recorded it, but it, it wasn't so much so the reason behind it. Scripture reveals that Jesus never seemed very concerned with his carnal appetite, never. And I'll remind you what we read in Matthew chapter 4 when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights without any food or water. So he went for well over a month without a single crumb of bread, and he seemed to hold together pretty well. He resisted all temptation. He was very composed. He got through it all just fine. Here, he goes without breakfast, and he's flying off the handle. So is this really an issue of physical hung hunger? No, it's not. You know what this is? It's an issue of spiritual hunger. That's what's going on here. Jesus was driven by a spiritual appetite, not a physical appetite, but a spiritual one. You remember he said, my food, my food is to do the will of God. That's my food. That's what fills me up. That's what satis satisfies me is to do the will of God and to finish the work that he sent me to do. That's what, those are Jesus's words. And by the way, uh, Jesus, he knows the behavior of a fig tree better than you and I ever do. And so if he expected figs to be on that tree, then it's because figs were to be expected from that tree, whether it was in season or not. He expected figs. There was none. He curses it. Now, you want a little insight into this. William MacDonald writes about these uh, trees and says fig trees in Bible lands produced an early edible fruit before the leaves appeared. Did you know that about fig trees? Probably not because I don't, you know, there's not a lot around here. But apparently, fig trees do produce an early edible fruit before the leaves appeared. And that's why Matthew's careful to say that it did have leaves on it. And there was nothing else, just leaves. McDonald goes on and says, this was a harbinger of that early fruit, the smaller edible fruits that it produced, was a harbinger of the regular crop. So if no early figs appeared, it indicated that there'd be no regular figs later on. If it ain't producing fruit now, I know what the future holds. So what bothered Jesus was that he was being deprived, not of physical sustenance, but of spiritual satisfaction. 
And I'll tell you this to bring it home for you and I. Um, to this day, nothing quite grieves the Holy Spirit of Christ like this. Nothing grieves the Spirit more than moral people who cover up their spiritual barrenness with a bunch of religious foliage. I hope, I, I hope you know what I mean by that. Uh, they aren't living lives that are nourished by the life-giving sap of the Spirit in order to produce what God put them on earth to produce. They're just religious. Uh, you know, they come to church and they, they wear that leaf and then they, um, they do some things and, and, wear that, and they're nice to their coworkers and they put that leaf on. And then, um, and then they, when a, a neighbor moves in next door, they, they, they're sure to bake a casserole and bring it over there with a smile. And that's another fig leaf. So they're covered with religious foliage. They have all the outward appearance of health and productivity as a Christian, but none of the substance. You know what we call that? <clears throat> we call it false advertising. And nobody appreciates fal false advertising uh, not you, not I, not Christ. And so this tree that we read about with the leaves on it, the fig leaves were just a cover-up. Just a cover-up to hide the humiliating evidence of their failure underneath. It's very reminiscent of Genesis chapter 3. You remember what happened in Genesis 3? Adam and Eve sinned, and what did they do? They sowed leaves. You remember what kind of leaves they were? <laughs> fig trees get such a bad rap. You know, there are a couple things in God's creation. I'm like, I'm sorry. I feel like I should apologize. One is fig trees. The other one's sheep. It's like, you know, you should get a, get a bad rap. And so here we have, again, a cover-up, false advertising. Fig leaves are as thin as religion is. If that's all you've got to cover up your sin, both fig leaves and your religion is going to wither away eventually. And it's going to reveal what was hidden beneath all along at some point or another. Um, scripture describes Israel as a fig tree in many instances. You go back to the Old Testament, there's a number of passages where Israel is uh, illustrated as a, as a fig tree, oftentimes a fruitless fig tree. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 13, for example, God says, I will surely consume them, speaking of Israel, Judah, I believe, he says, no, no figs shall be on the fig tree. The leaf shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass away from them. And now here it's happening in real, real time, but uh, that was a prophecy from Jeremiah. Hosea also picked up on that imagery. In chapter 9, verse 10, he says, speaking for God, When I found Israel, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. It was refreshing. It was... Uh, a joy. But when they came to Baal Peor, a certain place, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing that they loved. So the fig tree, you know, it was a wonderful thing. And now it's corrupt and cursed and withered. In Micah chapter 7, verse 1, the prophet says, How miserable I am! Not a single early fig can be found to satisfy my hunger. Now that was hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born in a manger, and it's almost like we hear the voice of Christ speaking through the prophet Micah. How miserable I am. I've come here to the fig tree and not a single early fig can be found to satisfy my hunger. God has the right to expect fruit. Or God has the right to expect results, whether it be fruit or anything else from the parts of his creation that he designed to produce it. Random fig trees are one of those parts. If he designs a tree to produce figs, he has the right to expect that it produce figs. The nation of Israel is another part of his creation meant to produce fruit. And if God doesn't see fruit, he won't hesitate to curse either one. And I'll tell you, adding another element to this, that the same is true of our ministry here. If it fails to bear fruit, do you think that God would spare us when he didn't even spare Israel? So you've got a fig tree, and you've got a nation. And right in between, somewhere in there, is our church. A little more important than a fig tree, I think. Probably a little less important. Let's not too think too highly of ourselves here. Probably a little less important than the nation of Israel. So somewhere in between is us. And you've got to wonder what God thinks. Because we're either producing the fruit that God intended when he started this whole thing, 
when he worked in the church that sent me to initiate this whole thing, when he worked in me and Sarah to take the jump and move, when he worked in each one of you along the way that's been added as a, in a leadership role or as a, a member. And to now some of you here that are starting to come into this, what's God mean by that? He means to, for us to bear fruit. So here we all sit today and we have to evaluate whether we're producing the fruit that God intends or we're barren. Little more than a good business. In verse 20, the disciples saw what Jesus had done. They saw the tree and they marveled. And they said, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? And so Jesus answered and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you had faith and don't doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it would be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Okay? Well, the disciples behold what Jesus has just done to that tree, and they marvel. That means they're shocked. I can suppose they are. They're amazed. Um, really, a, a, an understanding of that word it means that they were trying to wrap their minds around it, trying to make sense of what was going on there. <clears throat> and so they're shocked, yes, but they aren't shocked that Jesus did something supernatural. I guarantee you that, because they had seen Jesus do all kinds of supernatural stuff thousands of times. I'll also remind you that Jesus endowed them with the ability to do supernatural things. He sent them out, and they were casting out demons, and they were healing the sick and, and doing all of that. So that's not what shocked them, seeing something supernatural like this. Um, they, the reason they're so stunned is because they'd never seen Jesus uh, use his power to kill they had never seen him use this divine ability, this miraculous power to curse and kill. Up until now, they had only seen him use it to heal and to bless. And this is the only time that Jesus used his power to harm, to do harm. So it kind of seemed out of character, didn't it? I'm sure to them that was just kind of a, uh, a really difficult thing for them to grasp. That's why they marveled. Um, but I would tell you that it's always a mistake for you to assume that you've got Jesus figured out. As soon as you think you do, he's going to sh show you that you're wrong. You think you got Jesus all figured out, everything's, everything's predictable about him. No, he's a very un unpredictable individual. Now in verse 21, Jesus indicates to his disciples here that it requires faith to do what he just did. And he says that if they have it, if they have faith, that they could do what he just did and more. Okay, not only could you do what I just did to this fig tree, boy, you'd be able to say to this mountain, be thrown into the sea and it would, it would actually happen. Um, what does he mean by that? I mean, faith, when we talk about faith, what exactly are we referring to and what is Jesus speaking of? Uh, I would explain it like this. Faith is the peace of mind in knowing that your life and that your words and your actions and everything are aligned with God's heart. It's the peace of mind knowing that your life is aligned with God's heart and God's will, no matter how man might respond, so that if you're living like God would have you live and you're doing life like Christ would have you do, uh, you, you're going you're gonna to cause waves. It's going to bother people. But their being bothered needn't bother you because you know you're in the will of God. That's what faith is. It's knowing God's will and then being confident enough in it to act on it and just leave the outcome in God's hands. You do what God's told you to do and leave it at that. Hebrews chapter 11 speaks of faith as confidence, assurance, and conviction. You're, you're certain. And it says that without that, it's impossible to please God at all. So, Faith is an essential component in all of ministry. All ministry. So Jesus goes into the temple now in verse 23, and it says, When he came in, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching. And they said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Oh, they're bothered. They're remembering what happened yesterday. Jesus is destroying their business. They're no happier with Jesus 
than the residents of Ephesus were with Paul, who when he came preaching, was stealing all the business from the people who made temple idols. Right? They had their pagan temples there. They were making uh, little idols uh, to the gods of Diana and, and all this. And the silversmiths were all upset because they were taking away the business. And this is no different here. It's, it, they're ruining the business, <clears throat> and so they're bothered. And they're also bothered. I think people are bothered. It always bothers us to see and know that there is this other side to Jesus. Like he starts throwing things around and we're like, I don't really know if I believe in that kind of Jesus. Because we believe in a, 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 a happy gospel. We like our happy gospel where, you know, things are always nice. Jesus makes life stable and predictable. He doesn't rock the boat, never throws us a curve. We like a tame Jesus that just, he exercises his power and authority in ways that never alarm anybody. It's always calm around Jesus and it's good for all. Um, but there's this other side to Christ that we can't ignore and that's the one of wrath. And most people wish that wrath wasn't a reality in our religion, but it is. Uh, research tells us that for every reference to God's mercy and grace in the Bible, there are three references to his wrath. For every reference to God's mercy and grace, there's three to wrath. And that there are more references in Scripture to the anger, fury, and wrath of God than there are to his love and tenderness. But you wouldn't know that uh, by listening to what might be average American gospel teaching and preaching. Okay, because we like to focus on the love and the tenderness and the compassion. And in order to do that then, we have to, in a three-to-one ratio... Uh, ignore what the rest of the Bible is telling us. Um, but we like our happy gospel. Uh, and why is it, why is this <clears throat> such a, a, a thing here? Why is God's anger and wrath so prominent in Scripture, if we're willing to acknowledge that? I believe it's because wrath and love, they aren't mutually exclusive emotions. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. Let me uh, illustrate it for you like this. If, uh, if someone to, were to abuse a man's wife, how do you think that man would react? If you were to abuse a man's wife, you would invoke that man's fury because he loves her. It's because he loves her. If he never got angry, then it's because he doesn't love so in that case, wrath is an expression, believe it or not, of love. It might seem rather counterintuitive, but I believe it's true. In the words of one Presbyterian minister, we can't really have a Savior who's all love and no wrath. Right? The Lord loves his Father and his Father's house, so he must take umbrage when it's corrupted. He loves people, and so he must be offended by behavior that leads them astray and places obstacles in the way of their salvation. Would you agree with that? If Jesus really loves God, really loves the church, really loves people, then he's going to be furious with those who seek to destroy that work. First Corinthians, I'll remember and remind you, of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, very popular chapter at weddings at least. The Apostle Paul said, If I had the kind of faith that could move mountains, like Jesus spoke of in verse 21, if you had faith, you could move mountains. And Paul says, If I had that kind of faith that was able to move mountains, but I didn't love others, it'd be nothing, it'd be worthless. You know what that tells us? That tells us then that when Jesus cleared the temple last week or when he cursed the fig tree like he did just now, he did it in love. That love was the undergirding motive of his actions. Where there's love, there's liable to be expressions of anger and wrath as well, at least occasionally. In verse 24, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, I'll ask you one thing, which if you tell me, then I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? Was it from heaven or from men? 
Nah, they reason among themselves and they say, ah, if we say from heaven, he's going to say, why then didn't you believe him? But if we say, well, from men, we fear the multitude because they all think that John was a prophet. So Jesus knew which questions to ask them to put them into a corner. And in the corner they are. They don't know what to do about it. Now, you remember uh, concerning John's baptism, you remember that he was the foreigner of Christ. He came at the onset of uh, Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> and he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. And his baptism was specifically a baptism of repentance. It was to mark the changing of a, an individual's mind and the setting of them on a new path altogether. And uh, you remember that the Pharisees came down there out of curiosity or some other motive. And none of them ever got baptized by John. So the, the Jewish leaders were very familiar with John, uh, but they never got baptized by him. They wouldn't uh, submit themselves to his ministry. And the reason that uh, they never got baptized is because John wouldn't do it. And the reason John wouldn't baptize them is because their lives bore no evidence of any repentance at all. You remember? When they came to John, what did he say? Oh, you guys want to get baptized? That's awesome, because we want numbers. No. They came down and Jesus, uh, John rather, called them brood of vipers. He said, go bear fruit. Go prove that you've repented. And they never did that. So they've still yet to be showing any signs of mind change. They're still the same people they've always been. Hostile to John, now they're hostile to Christ. If they would have repented, it would have been the early fruit that God was looking for. Remember? Because repentance is just a harbinger of even greater things to come. That's where the Christian life starts, with repentance. You change your mind. You go, you know what? I've been a stubborn jerk. I know that God is real and I just need to quit being a, an idiot. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender my life to Christ. I'm going to make the changes I know he wants me to make, the ones that I've been resisting him on for a long time. So I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to start doing that. And that's where, that's where the Christian life begins. And I'll tell you that that is just the early fruit. God is satisfied by that. And it's a harbinger of the wonderful things that lie ahead. But it has to start with repentance. Theirs didn't. They wouldn't do it. It's always important that a person begin there by responding in faith. So whatever amount of revelation God gives to a person, that's what they need to respond to. And I'll tell you that uh, uh, if you refuse to uh, acknowledge God and respond to the truth that you have today, well, then that only deadens your senses to any truth that you might be given tomorrow. It makes it more difficult. If you're not bearing fruit now, you're probably not going to bear fruit in the years to come. And so their rejection of John three years prior, or three and a half years prior, was catching up to him now. <clears throat> it always does. You uh, are confronted by the truth. Like, you know, Jesus floats into your life. Uh, somebody you know has been sharing the truth, and, and you feel that, and your conscience is bothered, and you're a little unsettled. Um, it, it's going to catch up to you if you reject it. It always does. Uh, theirs happened three years ago, and uh, back then, uh, it was in the wilderness that they went out to confront John, uh, and they found the truth there, which was fine, because out there they could walk away from it, but now the truth has come to confront them in their own temple at the very heart of their religion, and uh, there's no getting away from it. Jesus is there face to face, and uh, the fig leaves that they've been wearing all these years are starting to wither now, and they're being exposed publicly and they're embarrassed by themselves and got nowhere to go. So they don't know what to do. They're in a corner. In verse 27, they answered Jesus and said, we don't know. <laughs> yes, they do know, but of course they're, well, I, I'm not going to answer that. No way. And then Jesus goes, then I'm not going to answer you. <laughs> then I'm not going to tell you by what authority I do these things. So we're even. And they, they got the point, no doubt. They hate Jesus. And now he's going to illustrate their rejection of John's ministry with a little parable. And uh, Matthew is, is uh, keen on parables. We've had several already and we'll have many more. Jesus says, well, well what do you think? So the conversation's not over. Jesus is going to drag this out a little bit because uh, there are some things yet that they need to see. And by the end of it, they're just going to be uh, in fits. Okay, They're going to kill him. What do you think? 
a man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And the son answered and said, I'm not going. And afterward, he, he thought about it, he regretted it, and he did. Um, but he came to the second and said, Likewise, and that one answered and said, I'll go, sure. But he didn't. So which of the two did the will of his father? Which of the two served dad? Which of the two did what God wanted him to do? And well, the answer is obvious. They'd be stupid to not answer that one. So they said to him, well, the first. And Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you, now here's the application, tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Because John came to you in the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed in him. And when you saw it, you didn't afterward relent and believe in him. So it's as if they were given the chance to come and to serve the Lord under his conditions and they wouldn't have it. And yet there are others who, for the longest time, had rejected the God of Israel, lived as tax collectors and sinners and harlots, which means prostitutes and all the rest. And yet now they're repenting at the truth. And so Jesus says, by John's ministry, you're condemned. Okay? The guy who, you're not sure if he came from man or from God. You're not sure if he was just making stuff up or if he was really filled with the Spirit. The guy that you, whose ministry is questionable to you, his ministry condemned you. He got done what he was sent to do. And I'll remind you that John was not a polished minister. He was not one of those smiling guys who you know, have all the diplomacy and tact that you see in some modern ministers. Uh, he was what we would call rough around the edges. Um, he ate bugs, uh, not to just, you know, as a sort of party favor, you know, like, watch this. <laughs> That's how he got by, bugs and honey. He wore unconventional clothing. The guy lived in the woods. And they may have had some justifiable reason to reject John himself on account of how he <laughs> came off. But these people that had rejected him sealed their own fate when their eyes were closed to the fruit that John's ministry produced. Okay, go ahead and reject John, but you can't reject what is happening because of the way that he serves the Lord. Even Jesus said, hey, if you don't believe me, then at least believe the works that I do. Okay, you, I might put you off. I might bother you a little bit. I might not look like your typical Messiah, but... If you will just look at the fruit my life produces, the people I heal, the, the, the blessings I give, and the approach I take, then at least believe me for how I lived. Um, John's ministry was enough that it brought tax collectors who would have been kind of the white collar. They work for the government. They live the high life, a lot of money, uh, despicable types. Or, or the harlots, tax, tax collector, or the harlots, and those are the low life, you know, prostitutes, don't care what is done with their body, self abusive, and all the rest of. And, and if John's ministry was enough to bring both ends of the spectrum to their senses about their own sin, you close your eyes to that, and you think that's just made up? Like John just could do that on his own, like anybody could just do that on their own without God's endorsement? Well, the chief priests couldn't say the same about their own ministry, could they? Were they bringing uh, people from all ends of the spectrum into faith in God? No, they were just going on with their business. Their ministry wasn't uh, bearing the fruit it was meant to bear, not like John's was. And so ultimately, they were in need of repentance as much as the the riffraff of Israel, the people they hated, the tax collectors and the sinners and the harlots and everybody else. But they rejected the offer to repent. And so their rejection of John three and a half years ago was just a precursor, really, to their rejection of Christ, which inevitably follows. If a person hardens their heart against those who serve the Lord, then they're inevitably hardening their heart to the Lord himself. Um, I want to turn now, in, as we wrap things up, to Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> this is another illustration that Jesus gave at one point in his ministry. I don't think he uh, is that far along in Luke chapter 13. This must have happened um, already, but it was a parable that spoke to the near future of what we read about in Matthew 21. He spoke this parable in verse 6 of Luke 13. 
A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And so then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. So cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also. Uh, I'll dig around it. I'll fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, good. If not, after that you can cut it down. After that, you can cut it down. And Jesus spoke this well before he ever showed up and cursed the fig tree. This was a warning to them. Last chance to repent. Last chance to get things right. Last chance to surrender your life to God. And they still didn't do it. And so he comes cursing the fig tree, which is a, an illustration of Israel, because Israel was on the verge of being cursed itself. <clears throat> and so if he's willing to do that to a tree or to a nation, I tell you that God will not bless a ministry whether it be anybody else's or ours. God will not bless a ministry that strays from his mission. That's why we were commissioned to do his will. And if that ministry, any one of them, actively resists his correction, then God's just going to take it away. But he doesn't want to do that. God doesn't want to cut down anybody's ministry, let alone ours here at this church. The Bible reveals that he'd do everything he can to prevent it from happening. He tried to do what he could here by way of his teaching and through the patience he demonstrated. Turn, turn, turn from your sins. Don't, don't keep going down this road. You're on the verge of being cursed, is what Hebrews 6 tells us. And so God's going to do everything he can to stop it from happening before it gets that bad. So instead of cursing the whole tree, he begins instead by pruning every branch from that tree that doesn't produce fruit. Rather than just going and chopping the whole thing down, he's going to look at the branches of that tree or the people in that ministry and prune them away before it gets so bad that the whole ministry has to be brought to an end. And that's what God does here in our church, believers' church. Uh, he removes the barren, the fruitless, the diseased, the unproductive, the ones that won't repent, the ones that won't receive healing and restoration, he removes that person from the ministry in hopes of keeping the ministry itself alive, that it, as a whole, might continue to bear the fruit that it was designed to produce. And we've seen him do this time and time again. God's pruned branches here, and if your life is unproductive, he'll give you warning, few more years, few more years, and if there is no repentance or interest in it, wait and see what happens. God will continue to prune it away until finally there's nothing left to do but to cut the whole tree down. Uh, a lot of you guys already know this, but if you were paying attention, I had a tree in my front yard that for years and years and years stood as a wonderful illustration just waiting to be used. And today's the day. It was a plum tree that was growing for long before we ever moved in. <clears throat> and I never knew it was a plum tree because the fruit it produced looked more like cat dung than anything. I'm not kidding. It got a nickname. My tree had a nickname. It was the cat turd tree. One uh, summer, I came to discover what kind of a tree it actually was because there at the very top was a plum, an actual red plum. It looked awesome. I'm like, this is a plum tree, Sarah. After all these years, I never would have known. Uh, and the funny thing about it was it was uh, beautiful this time of year because it just bloomed and it was full of flowers. We actually had some posters and advertisements designed for the church where I took a picture of the church behind that tree. So it was just flowers in the church. Um, and I had to make sure I did it at the right time of the year because if I had taken that picture, you know, a little too late, it would have been like, who wants to go to church there? You know, <laughs> At any rate, um, I did what I could with that tree. I sprayed it and did all kinds of stuff. I did some research, found out what kind of a disease it had, and um, I tried to save it. Uh, but every year, more dead branches, you know, less foliage. And so I'd cut the dead ones off. And pretty soon, did, if you saw it this year, it was just one big branch sticking sideways into the sidewalk. A big stump and a branch. And uh, a couple of years back, I planted a cherry tree right next to it so that I knew the day was coming, I'm cutting this thing down, and I, now I, I still have a cherry tree there. So I still got something, uh, but uh, just about a month ago or, or so, um, my kids had the joy and privilege of cutting her down with an axe. We laid an axe to the root of the tree, and 
It was a, a, a good thing for the Thompson yard. We were meant for fruit, just like that tree was meant for fruit. And it didn't do what it was supposed to do. We are meant for fruit. And when I say we, I mean we as branches. You each individually as branches were designed by God with particular DNA, a God-given skill set, all kinds of resources that have been accumulated along the way, and you were meant to serve him and to bear fruit for his kingdom. So you as individuals, also we as a tree, as a ministry, we're meant to bear fruit. God has specific intentions with this ministry, and I, for one, I don't want us to be found unfruitful. I don't want us to run the risk as a church of one day being cursed. So as branches of this tree, I would ask you this morning to take an honest assessment of your life right now, whatever season you're in, and determine whether you're bearing the fruit that Jesus would expect to find if he walked into your life to evaluate would he find at least early fruit. Is there anything in your life right now that indicates you're on the right path and you're going in the right direction and there is greater fruit to come? Because if there's not, you have been given another, yet another chance to repent and align your life with the word of God that you in the end aren't cursed.